Today on The Bootser Founder is Johannes Radig, a German indie hacker and digital nomad who shares his journey of building a business while traveling the world. We talk about his nomadic lifestyle and changing it to becoming more of a localized entrepreneur and the challenges he faced along the way, quite literally because he went from place to place. He talks about the importance of customer interviews. We dive really deep into that and the pivot of his business from an audit tool to an onboarding SaaS, why that happened, how it happened, and why it had to happen. This episode is sponsored by Acquire.com. More on that later. Now here is Johannes. It's not often that I get to talk to a German indie hacker on this show because there are really just a few of us, but it's especially rare to talk to somebody who comes from my hometown and to someone who moved far away to a faraway place to run a digital business from. A German on the Canary Islands. That's really cool. Do you consider yourself a digital nomad? Is that still something we do? <laughs> First of all, thanks for having me, Arvid. Uh, yeah, if, I'm, um, I am, I do consider myself a digital nomad who has settled in Tenerife, I would say, uh, but I'm still traveling a fair bit uh, because I also really enjoy traveling still, but th this is, this has become my base. Yes, for sure. That's really cool. So I, I know you have like a history in, in nomading around, right? Like you were more, more actively traveling through the world. Can you maybe like, was it an intentional thing to, to do this as like a, a business thing? Like, did you travel because you wanted to run a business at the same time? Or did you just travel and then you happen to become uh, an indie hacker or a nomad that builds stuff? So um, I used to live in, in London um, and it's a great, great city. Um, but at some point you kind of feel like maybe there, there's, there's more to, to be seen in the world. And, and uh, I've always enjoyed traveling a lot. And so during um, my last job before I became an indie founder as well, um, I kind of just heard about this nomadism thing. And I was like, well, this, this seems to be interesting. Is this not something we can try out? So I was talking to my, at the point, my, my girlfriend, now my wife, and we're both really excited about this, this, uh, this concept. Um, and so in, and so we basically just, we booked a flight. Like we maybe around September, October time, we looked into flights in the coming summer. And then we, we found one really cheap flight from, from London to, um, uh, to Cuba. We were like, okay, let's just book that and make that the date. And so that's when we, um, I already had conversations with my boss at the time as well to, you know, prepare him for this, uh, that this will come. Um, and then we just embarked on it really. And that was in 2018. Um, yeah. That's crazy. So, so uh, can you, can you walk me through this? Like you fly to Cuba and then what? <laughs> like, did you already so you, have something in mind? Like what that's to do a there? great question because for those who have been to Cuba, they will know that internet in Cuba and working remotely in Cuba do not go well together. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, Sarah, let's just say Sarah. Sarah had a job um, to basically working as a uh, an online teacher uh, in um, to to teach Chinese children. Of it, there's another thing that we can maybe touch on because that was yeah, holy, wow. for your previous company. And um, so she was teaching Chinese uh, uh, children uh, English, and so she had to be online also at very you know ran very early in the morning Cuban time. And so we so in Cuba you don't have uh, like a private um, residences don't have internet. So basically you find internet in public squares and you have to buy a kind of scratch card with a code. And then you uh, put in this code when you log into this Wi-Fi hotspot and you kind of pray that it kind of works. And most of the time it doesn't really. And so uh, Sarah found a hotel nearby that's, that had internet. That, so that there's there are a few hotels, but it's probably like less than 10 in the whole of Cuba that have internet. And uh, kind of taught from there, but basically she ended up being fired from that job because it just didn't work, <laughs> which was probably a, a, a blessing in disguise because it, it probably wasn't the best job for her anyway. Uh, she enjoyed it, but the pay was, wasn't very good. Um, but yeah, so that's how it started. So Cuba was basically, we quickly realized working from here probably isn't going to be too, um, productive. And, uh, so we just basically postponed it until we, we, um, made it to Mexico a couple of weeks later, and then we started to properly work remotely. Okay. That's a, that's such an interesting path to travel. Cause if, when I think about indie hacking, like and in no, digital nomadism combined, right. In the, the culture and the community that we're both in, I think about Bali, I think about like Thailand or Vietnam, like places in Southeast Asia, 
the fact that you went to Cuba of all places and then to Mexico, which is also, again, like not towards Asia, but further away from it. I mean, that's a globe, you know, further away also means kind of closer, but you know what I mean, right? That's an interesting choice. So, so you, it, it sounds like you didn't really, either you didn't do the research or you didn't really care about the, the specificity of where you go. You just wanted to travel. Like, was there a, a kind of motivation other, other than just traveling or, or were you just like, oh, well, let's go there? No, we definitely, we really wanted to go to, to Central and South America. So that was definitely um, something we wanted to explore. Mexico actually is still North America. So North, Central and South America, to be precise. And um, we, I, I had never been at, actually before. So that was my first time uh, on, on that continent. And we just thought we would make it work. So obviously, yes, Bali also at the time was already more famous for remote working, but it still wasn't big. Like it was, it was famous for backpacking mostly, I think at the time. Um, and yeah, so that's why we thought, okay, let's, let's try out Central South America and see, um, see if we like it. Did you? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, it's yeah. It, I mean, we really enjoyed it. I mean, there's a lot of stories we can, we can talk about from hiking up a volcano in Guatemala, an active volcano and um, having marshmallows fried in the lava to um, meeting many interesting people and incredible landscapes, um, incredible culture. Um, it's, it's been really great. So yeah, if you haven't been, I don't know, have you been to, to South America, Central America? I have been to South America, but it was a cruise. I, I went there with my grandma. Like my grandma was in, in her 80s, I guess. And she always wanted to go to Tierra del Fuego, like the, the fire island on, on the southern tip of South America. Uh, because that was a childhood dream of hers. Like she, she was born in 1933. And like back then, Germany... Not the most, uh, you know, joyous time to be alive, like with the war and all that kind of stuff. Also, the educational system was a bit weird. Let's just say that, right? So she, she didn't get to see much of the world, obviously, and she didn't learn much about it, but she saw on a map that part of South America. I really wanted to go there. So I took her. I took her on a cruise. We went to Buenos Aires. We, we've uh, just traveled all the way down to the southern tip and to Chile on the other way back. But I never made it like past Argentina towards the north, which... I would love to go like that. That is a, a very interesting part of the world for sure. But yeah, that's, that's, that's my experience there. It sounds like you had a really good time there, right? What, what made you then, wh where did you go from there? Cause you ended up somewhere else, right? So yeah, so we, we spent, we ended up spending uh, about two years traveling across the whole continent, all the way down to, to Patagonia, actually. Um, with a few stints where I also had to go somewhere else for work reasons, but, uh, we basically traveled all the way down. We didn't go to every single country, but we spent, uh, we usually spent about one to two months, sometimes even three months in, in the countries we visited. Um, so we had a great time. And then, um, and then we, we hopped over, uh, to, to South Africa. So that was, um, another country we wanted to visit and, we found a flight from Brazil at the time to, to, to visit South Africa and obviously very different, um, but also super interesting, uh, specifically Cape Town, Johannesburg, Jayburg. I, I like to say Johannesburg because obviously my name is in it. So Jayburg <laughs> is usually what the, what the locals say. Um, oh, that's funny. How did you make money along the way? Like, were you already building things or were you like working as a freelancer at the time? Yeah, that's a great question. Sorry. I didn't even touch on that. So yeah, I was, um, I was working as a freelancer and um, specifically, so my background is mostly marketing um, apart from being a founder later on and doing everything basically. Right. Um, so my expertise lies in marketing SEO, but also, um, you know, paid channels like Facebook, Instagram ads, um, basically all the advertising channels that are out there. I've at some point in my career touched on. And so I've, I helped uh, different companies uh, with that, um, with uh, SEO and also running running ads for like for example a D2C startup and and uh, had a few different clients along the way yeah well that's cool so like 
I would just wonder, like, when did the spark for building your own thing happen along this path? Like, where, you know, I, I mean, now we are in the story, at least, we're somewhere in South Africa, which is also a, a great place. I got to visit there just before the pandemic changed the world, which was uh, really fortunate. That was funny enough, kind of ties things together a little bit, because you mentioned Sarah was doing this online English teaching. We had a business that was facilitating some administrative stuff for online English teachers. We sold that just in 2019. And because we sold that, we got to travel. And that was because, and like for that reason, we ended up in South Africa at that point. Got to see all those places that you mentioned as well, including Jayburg, which is a very interesting place for sure. So, how did you make it to the Canary Islands, where I think you're more stationary now, right? And and uh, does it have to do with you actually building a business at this time, like that you try to find a place, you know, to to build a home, kind of a you know an, an office in? Uh, yeah, great question again. So. Um, I've always had this, I guess, dream to to be a founder, to be an entrepreneur. I always felt that this is kind of what I meant to do. Um, actually, it was also part of my family life. So my my dad and also my stepdad are both entrepreneurs. And so is my mom also to, to most of her career. So it was always part of my life. And so I thought, okay, uh, at some point I need to try something. Um and the, the freelance work, I would say, also really gave me a lot of confidence in my my skills and, and being able to work by myself or ideally with someone else. Um, and so basically I had this idea. And what the first thing I did, so this might be interesting. I The first thing I did in the beginning of 2020, uh, you know, New Year's Eve, you kind of, you know, have things that you want to do in the year. So one of the things I did was I reached out to um, people in kind of, Good, good friends of mine, but professional friends, let's say. So people I really respect uh, in the marketing world, business world. Uh, and just ask them like, so ask them a relatively broad question about um, things that they sh- think should be done better or should be, um, what there should be like a better software for, or there should be some kind of automation for, what, something like that. Like it was pretty a pretty broad question and it wasn't probably wasn't a great question either, but at least it was a starting point. And actually from that, I got a few really good responses back. And um, that led us or led me first to the, the path of what has what later became Leedsy. Um, so that was the starting point. Leedsy is an interesting thing. I, I do want to I do want to talk about this because it's it, it feels you just said something. I, I don't know if you noticed that, but you said ideally building it with somebody else. That is not necessarily the the solopreneur perspective that you get to see in in indie hacking and in digital nomading, where people just say, "I'm going to go there, I'm going to do whatever I want." Right? It sounds like you you are, of course, you are in a partnership, like a you know a romantic partnership, but also in a business partnership, and that is that is not something that most indie hackers. The indie part to many is very independent, right? So how does that play into this? Like, uh, did you did you build this with a co-founder from the start? Good. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. So as I said, beginning of 2020, I reached out to some people and then I, um, something that I'm, I've been doing for a couple of years too is I'm mentoring startups. Actually, funny enough, startups that are on the VC track. So they get VC uh-huh. investments and they join an accelerator program. Um, specifically with 500 global. It's, that's a VC I've been working for mostly. Um, and so at the time, beginning of 2020, I was in a program in, I believe it was Saudi Arabia. Um, so working with startups from the, the Middle East uh, region. Um, and my, I met someone there, always already in the previous program, but someone I, you know, got along really well with. And I really, you know, just enjoyed his company. And I was talking to him about my business or my business idea at this point. It was not a business. And, um, but I started, um, just started to do some work on my own. So I started to hack something together with no code tools to, uh, to build this first, pro- this first kind of lead. I'll talk a bit more about what it actually was, but so I hacked something together with no code. I can code a little bit, but it's, it's, it's very basic. Um, and, um, and at the same time also started to do some validation by uh, reaching out to possible customers. So specifically uh, they were, um, yeah, marketing agencies actually already, already at the time. So I, you know, try to find ways to, to cold email them and actually pretty quickly had interviews lined up. So during the program, during this accelerator program, 
in the evenings, I basically, and also the mornings sometimes, I took some time to talk to potential clients uh, of this new solution, which I hadn't even uh, hadn't even built at the time, right? That's actually something we could talk about uh, as well, um, why that's so important. So, so this person that I met there, his name is Robert Desmond. Um, he, I guess he was really, really impressed by that, I guess, to some extent. Uh, and I think he also deep down wanted to do his own thing. Um, and yeah, we just started talking about it and that intensified over the coming months. And then we started to do this venture together. And I'm extremely happy that it happened that way because I think doing it alone is uh, by multitudes more difficult. Um, and um, yeah, I think having a co-founder is, is, makes it easier in many ways. And so I'm very glad that, that it was, that's how it happened. Is is he a technical co-founder? Would you call him that? Yes, yes. So he's a he's a developer, um, um, and he um, yeah he's the technical side. He's he's the CTO essentially of the of Leedsy, and uh, he's also great in many other areas. So he, we we complement each other a lot. Ah, uh, that's good. That's good to hear. And I guess that's that's really what you need, right? If you look in a co-founder for a business like this, you want somebody to complement your skills. I mean, that, that I've I've talked to Rob Walling about this and he's seen a lot of people in Tiny Seed and in inside their microconf community. He's seen examples of founders that get another marketing founder in. So they just have twice the capacity to do marketing, right? So it, it's not just you always have to find a technical and a non-technical founder. There are also groups of people with just two technical people and they figure it out along the way. So it's it's just interesting to see that you went for the complementary approach. Now, let's talk about Leetsy. What does Leetsy do? Or maybe what did Leetsy do in the beginning in your little prototype and what did it grow into? Perfect. So... um so in the beginning, my idea was more around helping uh, companies, startups, because I was working with startups, but generally companies uh, of any size to 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 be to be better at Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram ads. So what I've noticed also to, to, through my mentoring was people are just doing so many silly mistakes, uh, just burning money, you know. And the only one who's happy about it is probably Facebook, but not even them because they. Yeah, they're not going to see more money coming, right? If they're not successful. So, um, so what we built was a essentially like an audit tool. So a tool that would allow you to say, Hey, you know, uh, you get temporary access to my Facebook ad account. And then the tool would tell you recommendations. Um, and also give you a bit more visibility of like, what are you best creatives? Um, what's performing well, which audiences, and then so kind of going through best practices, um, like kind of like a checklist of what are you doing well and where, where could you maybe make some improvements? That was the first product. And then relatively quickly, we wanted to sell this to agencies as a way to generate leads. So many agencies usually, um, as part of their lead generation, they offer um, a free audit anyway to their potential clients. And we wanted to help them generate this audit at scale, basically, uh, with this, with the tool that we have. There are many similar tools that exist for that, by the way. So for SEO, it's a very common thing, um, but nothing existed. Still nothing really exists for, for paid, uh, specifically Facebook, uh, Instagram ads. And that's what we built. Um, but that's not what Leetsy is doing right now. So yeah. um, maybe you can ask me what went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting question because like th that explains the name too. Like that that lead focus and the lead in Leetsy, th now it rings a bell because right now you're building a very different tool. Like it's it's kind of a social media account onboarding tool, right? Like uh, what? How, how did that shift? Yeah, perfect. Great question. So yeah, so we, we kind of, we got some early validation and we felt like this is something really that agencies want. Um, but after building out, let's say, a prototype, like something that actually worked pretty well uh, and working on it really for probably, let's say, maybe six months or so, um, we we didn't, once we were kind of asking them like, so let, let's, you know, please pay for this now, they, they all went quiet, basically. I'm simplifying a little bit, but we didn't get a lot of um, payment intent. And that's always a sign that there's something a little bit off. Um, I don't want to go too much into details why that was, um, but we definitely realized hmm, this is not going to be an easy sell, right? And we kind of went back to the interviews that we had done. So something that we, so both my co-founder and I feel like it's 
that is very, very important when you're building a business is talking to your customers and to your potential customers. And we've done, we really did that a lot. We, we did, I'm pretty sure over 50 interviews with different agencies. Um, and, and so we kind of went back and kind of reflected what else did they tell us? Um, and when we did these interviews, we always asked about the entire kind of process. So, um, how do you find new clients, for example? Um, and then, so what happens when you onboard them and so on, right? So that the whole process to understand where are pain points, right? And how, where could our uh, product, potential product uh, help, potential solution help? And, um, this problem of onboarding, and specifically getting access to clients' accounts basically always came up. Every second conversation, the agencies would say, yeah, this is, this is such a, such a pain point. This is so painful. They, what they usually had to do was jumping on a Zoom call, uh, with, with the clients at the end of the day after, you know, they would send some instructions. The client would just kind of not do them or not do it right, uh, or be completely confused. And then they would have to go on a Zoom call and then walk the client through and be like, yeah, yeah, no, you have to click there. I'm not this, not that, you know, like it's just, it's super painful, right? And, and so, yeah, with this realization, we were like, okay, well, maybe we can actually build something, uh, that actually solves that specific issue. Um, and we did, uh, relatively quickly and we saw a lot more traction much quicker for this product. And that's why we then at some point decided to, to shut down the uh, audit. Well, you needed it to get there. That's, that's what I'm realizing from this, right? Like Leedsy as it is right now would never exist if you didn't have the necessity to really dig into the problems and challenges of your customers, which is cool, right? It's cool that you built something that allowed you to get to this level, then to jump on the next level from there. I think that's a, it's an important step for most indie hackers to understand that your first thing is probably going to suck in a, in a, in a neutral way, right? I'm, I'm not saying it's badly done. It may just not have the fit that you need, but it will facilitate conversations. I love the fact that you did like 50 of those interviews. That's really cool. And I love the fact that you zoomed out. Also really important. Did, did you do anything else during those, these interviews that gave you like an indication of budget or indication of payment intent that might not be apparent or very obvious to people, particularly people like me who are more technical and don't like to talk to other people that much, right? Unless it's about a cool topic that we both enjoy, you know, like German hip hop, but let's get to that later. Like the, <laughs> is, is, is there anything that you can share for indie hackers? to, to use in these kind of conversations. Yeah. So, I mean, there are obviously different tactics around, like what can you do to really understand if someone is happy to pay for a solution, but it's, it is tricky. So in our case, what we didn't do is we didn't just say, Hey, this is the promise of the tool. Just pay for it. Right. Like we didn't, we didn't do that. Um, not sure if that was a mistake or I don't know, but, um, we, um, we definitely, um, we just, which kind of first, we just gave the product out for free. And then we were thinking, well, if it generates value, then they're going to pay for it. Right. Um, but they, they kind of dragged their feet. Right. And so we kind of felt like this, there was something clearly uh, wrong here. And one of the, one of the specific interview techniques around value that I can maybe share is, uh, this is from a really great mentor we, we work with, um, is kind of asking them, how much, so this difficult question, how, how valuable is this to you? Right? Like, no, like, first of all, they don't want to say, yeah, this is, I, I would pay thousands of dollars for this, right? Because they don't really want to pay more than they have to. Um, so one of the techniques we, we used was we kind of asked them, uh, about other tools that they're paying for. And then we asked them to compare the value with another tool. So are you, um, is it as valuable as an Asana, let's say, right? Which is, I don't know, maybe $10 a month or mostly free even. Uh, or is it, is it as value as, you know, some specified uh, agency solution that costs, you know, north to $300. So th that was a way for us to understand the value of what we're offering and then also for, for the current product. So maybe that's something that, that can be helpful for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, and, and it seems to give you an indication of prices too. Right, like uh, what prices to go with? Did you do a lot of like pricing experimentation in the beginning, or do you still do that? Um, we we kind of, as I said, started with like these sort of interviews, and then from there we set a price. Um, and probably in the uh, there's something else we did which I probably should touch on. 
So we set some price, some arbitrary price based on kind of what we thought was going to be fine. Um, obviously, it was going to be way too cheap for sure, uh, like it always <laughs> yeah. is in the beginning. Yeah, sure um, is. What something else that we did, which might be a bit controversial, is we actually went on to AppSumo. Um, so that was in the beginning of 2021, I believe. Um, so it was relatively when we had the product in an, in a decent place. Um, and, uh, we wanted, to, what we wanted to do is we wanted to get real people using it. We wanted to get usage and we wanted to get feedback on that. Um, and I would say overall, it was a good experience, um, because we got a lot of feedback, but also the, the sort of customers that are on AppSumo, they are not necessarily, first of all, really do, they're def, they are most definitely not your best customers. Um, and many of them may not even use you. So we still have people contacting us now, you know, three years later and say, Oh yeah, I just sold it to someone else. Can you please change the, the, the username or whatever, the, you know, move the, move the account over. So it's still like, it's, it's a bit painful. We actually still do it because we're nice, but it's, uh, it, that was interesting. And we also had to fight to get our, to get the listing of AppSumo's website because but basically, you know, it's even if you stop your offer, you, you're still ranked, like you're still on the website. And when people search for your brand, they might find the AppSumo offer. And they're like, well, you know, this used to be, used to cost, I don't know what it was, $60 for like a very limited lifetime deal. And they would, this would anchor your pricing very quickly, right? It would be like, well, this was the used to be the price. So it can't cost 99 a month now, right? So that was something we had to navigate. Um, I mean, pricing, what we definitely realized at some point we were too cheap and we started raising our prices um, gradually. And we're probably going to do that again uh, at some point when we feel like we are, we can justify it. So when we add more value through um, a different, different integrations or features, let's say that really, you know, generate more value for our clients. then I think we're confident to raise prices. And I think that's something that companies, startups, indie hackers in particular uh, should do. Um, also, here's the, here's the thing. Definitely raise your prices for your existing customers. This is one of the biggest learnings that we had. So, um, obviously most, you know, if, if you're a nice, nice person, especially I feel like this is something that maybe developers really also feel like it's, it's almost compulsory. It's like, yeah, these early people that supported us, we cannot change the price for them. And I, I even I thought the same, but, um, that's the wrong thinking, I, I believe, now in okay. retrospective. Because in the beginning, we didn't raise it for the exact existing customers. Why? Okay. Yeah, why? Why? Because um, I think you, you're you going to leave a lot of money on the table. Uh, that's that's the main thing. And I, I also think, I mean, obviously, you don't have to raise the price for existing customers straight away. Like, it doesn't have to be like, you know, tomorrow is going to be more expensive. You can be nice about it and say, you know, you're going to have six months or some period of time to to show them that you you appreciate uh, obviously yeah the, that they're using you but also this is a business relationship right that <laughs> you don't have to be too thankful uh, they're getting value from it um, so it's, it's the main thing is you're leaving a lot of uh, money on the table and it creates it creates like um, also you have to manage old plans like legacy legacy things that's never a really good thing in your code or in even Stripe that's a, so it creates that's a good problems. point. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this too, like building my own thing right now. I already have like three tier pricing, knowing that oof, if I ever change something, now I'm going to have a fourth tier. It's going to be hidden, but still kind of there. Yeah, there's, there's complexity in this. And I think you're absolutely right. I love that you used the word payment intent earlier, because in a way, your existing customers are probably the highest payment intent like users that you ever have, right? The people who already pay. Like, clearly, they have intent to pay. So they should also be the people that you introduce new prices to because that might give you the most sane feedback or most informed feedback of all. Like if it's too high, they're going to fight back. And if it's high enough to to just like show how the value has increased over time, then you're on a good path. I really, really like this as a thought that, yeah, you do it with the people who already pay you, right? Who already yeah. have this this willingness to pay. Interesting. Exactly. So, so one more thing to add here is... Um, I think it's wise to look at your data and look at the customers who you're raising the prices for. And if you have customers who may be paying you, but they actually never really use you or very, very rarely, maybe consider not raising the price for them, right? Because you kind of know they're not getting value. 
right? So they may have just kind of forgotten about the subscription and, you know, like, okay, it's, you, it's not worth uh, kind of poking into that bee's nest, I guess you could say, or I don't know. <laughs> that is, but, that's another, another interesting point because now, now I think that there is a business opportunity even in just scoring the people for that, right? What is the likelihood of somebody canceling when I increase the prices and what is the likelihood of them actually paying it, right? That, and a per on a per account level with the usage metrics. I can see some indie hacker just typing away at an idea just now from, from this conversation. I, yeah, I, I would love to see this too because it feels like something could hook into Stripe or into Paddle and into some kind of metrics service. Ah, very cool. I want to talk about AppStream for a second, just as a, like a, a little general question about this. Would you do this again? If you were to build a new business, would you jumpstart it with this AppSumo lifetime, limited lifetime deal. I would like to know what the limitations were. Um, did it do enough good to warrant the little stressful things that you now need to deal with? I would say I would really think about it a lot. Um, I, I, I would tend to say probably not because now okay. I also feel confident that uh, even if things are relatively slow in the beginning, that's okay to, to spend some time to figure out how to get the, the right customer at least based on your hypothesis, right? Like in the beginning, you may not know exactly who is the perfect customer, but you can, you know, you have to be a little bit patient to try to get that customer or change it if you feel like it's going to be a different kind of persona. Um, whereas with AppSumo, it's like you kind of get anyone and many of them are just looking for a great deal, you know? So that's not, not very help, very useful. Uh, obviously, it gives you a bit of a cash uh, injection as well, which can be helpful. Um, in our case, maybe just also to, to share that both my co-founder and I, we both, uh, worked as freelancers on the site until probably a year and a half into the business. So, which is, I think, quite typical, I would guess. Um, but that's something you, you have to be prepared for too, to, to not ex accept, uh, not, not expect that your, your new little indie hacker project is going to pay you the bills. Right <laughs> there, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, like those things. And that's the fun part about slow growth. It's kind of linear. Like it is super slow in the beginning and you start with your $50 MR and then you get to a hundred a week later and, or hopefully or a month later or whatever. And then it's slow, 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 but it's going to keep being like, it's going to go up, right? So give it a year or two. And all of a sudden you're going from 6,000 to 6,500 and on and on and on. So you, you just reinforce these mechanisms that, that, yeah, of course, that's how it works. Did you have a, a kind of a, an MRR? Or any kind of revenue metric where you said, now it's time to go full time on this. But how was that choice made for both of you? I can't remember exactly the number now, to be honest with you. Um, I think definitely we had this, we had this number. Um, I, I, I think probably when we were able to pay, uh, us each, you know, more than, I guess more than maybe three, four thousand euros, something like that. Maybe, uh, I would say then we probably said, yeah, I think it's okay for us now to, to just, you know, quit, quit our, quit any other activity. Really the mentoring we're still doing, by the way, more or less both of us, uh, which, cause we just enjoy it. Um, but at that point we were like, okay, uh, we both luckily live in places that are not too expensive. So I think in London, it would be, would have been hard, uh, with, with, uh, I think maybe it was over two and a half thousand euros could be something like that. In London, you cannot really survive for that money. Uh, probably the same in Silicon Valley and uh, New York and many other ex more expensive places. And in Germany, most of Germany as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, the Canaries, Canaries are actually pr relatively cheap, which is, which is quite nice. And, uh, my co-founder lives, he's from the UK, but he lives in Poland. Uh, he has a family to feed. So there's definitely that consideration. Uh, and I think he may be, continue to work a little bit longer with, 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 uh, one day a week with, uh, doing some other consulting to get a bit more money in. But yeah, at some point we could uh, stop that. That's, that's very, very cool. It's, it's nice to see like that you, you both found smart places to live and operate from. I think that like you're right in most places, two and a half thousand euros, which is, yeah, I guess roughly the same in, in US is <laughs> depending right on the economy and all that. That is, that is definitely enough for most places, but definitely not enough for some. And most places where indie hackers congregate. Uh, or general, generally what developers congregate are bigger cities because that's where the bigger employers are. So if you want to take the, the change from being an employed salaried engineer to being an indie hacker in a place where you have to spend four thousand, five thousand dollars or whatever euros on rent and food every month, 
it's going to be tough, right? You're going to have to run this as a side project for a long, long time. So I guess that if you if you were in London, how long would it have taken you to actually run this project? Did you ever do the math? Like how much longer you would have done it on the side? Great question. I, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. it definitely, it must, it's much, much harder. I mean, yeah, you can also live on less, even in bigger cities, but then you have to move out of the city. Then, I mean, at least you don't have to commute so much if you kind of probably work from home. Uh, but it's definitely the, the life quality is, is, is a bit more, a bit less than if you, if it's much cheaper around you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, one thing that that you just said to me, like in in terms of um, d- risk, is is very interesting. I want to dive into this a little bit because you said like he's still working one day or was working one day on the side to kind of balance that off and make enough money to to sustain the family. And I think in in all indie hacking, all entrepreneurship, this kind of risk assessment is always one one of the most important things to do. Right, right. To so like, is it? okay for me to stop working as a freelancer or should I quit my job or should I go, go half time or whatever? Is the risk of my business exploding too high for me to make this choice or how easy is it to get back? So I'm, I'm particularly interested in this because you are working effectively with agencies who are using somebody else's credentials on somebody else's platform to do some work, like there is a lot of platform risk stacked on top of each other, right? You're, you're, you're working with clients that are shaky, that might lose their clients. Their clients are depending on platforms like Facebook or Google or Twitter or wherever you, the ads are being run, right? Like, how do you deal with those risks in particular that you're stacking all these platforms on top of each other? Nice. Yeah. Good question. Um, I actually feel like we haven't even, well, I haven't really said what Leedsy is really doing. So let me just yeah, do a I really guess. quick one. Like what's, so what we ended up building is a solution that helps agencies get access to their clients' accounts in an extremely easy way. So they just have one link, which is sent to their clients. And then the client can give access to, uh, you know, the Facebook page, ad accounts, all the different assets, as they're called. Uh, to uh, to all the different Google profiles, so Google Analytics, Google Ads, Search Console, Merchant Center, and so on. There's lots of uh, things there, as well as TikTok as, as well. So, but all through one link, and it walks the client through, and it, it makes it much much easier. So that's what we ended up building. So you're right. Um, of course, we have platform risk, um, which is it is what it is. Um, we, we've, we've lived, we are living with it. Um, we also definitely had to go through some problems with APIs where, for example, Facebook at some point just decided to switch something off and we were like, okay, this is a big problem, but you sort of work around it. Um, how do I deal with that? It's, you know, we, we're just enjoying the ride and we're just doing what we can. I think we believe that what we're doing is still at its like, it's not threatening Facebook and it's kind of like, it's something that they sh- probably, that there's no, I feel like there, there's no real, um, there's not crazy risk that they're going to switch this off for some reason, but it could happen. I don't know. Like the risk is there. So I also think, um, what is, what, what helps me personally is to think about, okay, what's the worst that can happen, right? So let's say Leedsy fails and, um, we have to shut down the business, which really hopefully is not going to happen. And there's a lot of other platforms we also have anyway. But if it happens, then um, there's all, there are always, always other opportunities out there, um, whether it's another indie hacker project or working for someone. Uh, we've met some really great people uh, along the way through this. So I think, you know, you just got to be open for for think about what's the worst that can happen. There's a nice exercise that Tim Ferriss recommends, which is the fear setting exercise. So really writing down what, what are you really scared about? And then what can, what's really the worst that could happen? And often you realize it's, it's really not that bad. And maybe it's also the, the nomading uh, in South America that made us realize that it's like, we can live with very little, uh, very nice lives. And, and I think we can, we could always go back to that uh, if, if needed, which we hopefully don't have to, but, it's it's a possibility. 
This is a very reasonable approach. I really like, I really like, like, honestly, it's very German of you. Just like, you know, straightforward, you know, like, yeah, this could happen. This could happen. We'll figure it out. I, I personally, I subscribe to the same, like, process, the same thinking. And fear setting is something that I regularly do because of this, because it allows me to see, okay. And if it fails, well, good. I learned something. If, if it doesn't fail, good. I'm, gonna keep learning something right like either way there's learning either way there's a, a move towards something else so that's that's really cool i i and and you're right like in a in a way if google were to turn off their oauth authentication which i guess is how they authenticate all their accounts or facebook were to do this but right? first off they authenticate their own platforms with this kind of tool so it would be very odd for them to just turn it off but if they would that something else would have to be there for people to give their money to Google or for to give their money to Facebook. And you could still facilitate that because that's something that when we had a, a conversation, when, when we had a customer interview, when I did a, a customer interview with you for my pro, uh, product, we talked a lot about jobs to be done. And I think that is a topic that I really want to dive into a little bit here because first off, you know a lot about it. You've, uh, you've mentored people on this issue and to me, what you're currently doing with Leetsy is a replacement of a very manual, very chaotic, very all over the place job to be done that and you consolidate into a software tool. If, if the platform should change, it would fall apart again into a, a manual chaotic process, which you could then build another software tool to facilitate, right? You, you would be able to recover because you already know how to take this manual process and turn it into a, a streamlined software solution. So maybe let's talk a little bit about the, job to be done here how did you figure this out other than through the the customer calls and how did you figure out how exactly to build a solution for a job that somebody else needed to be doing great yeah i, I love i love jobs to be done and, and talking about it and uh, mentoring startups on it so this is one of the topics that i usually cover in my uh in my kind of mentoring uh, and, and talks with with startups um and why is it so why is it so useful i think it makes you it makes you think about what is the core of somebody wants to that somebody wants to achieve right so um you could look at what we're doing at a surface level and of course there you you would notice or you would say well yeah we get the agency access and that that is true that is probably that is a job that we're doing for them but there's a lot more here right so and you figure that out really talking to to your customer but also asking the right questions. And so what we figured out is, for example, that there's there's a lot of um, uncertainty in the beginning when a agency starts working with a client. The client, um, you know, isn't still isn't really sure about the agency. So the agency has to build trust. They, they want to be seen as this, like, you know, very state-of-the-art uh, company that knows the latest trends and does everything like in a really good way. And so they want to project a very a, a good image. They want to make a good impression. They want to make a great impression, in fact. And what I talked about earlier, this this process of like, yeah, you have to click there and then share your screen and then click this. <laughs> right. It's just painful, right? So this that's why this is a, one of the, the most important realizations we've had that, you know, it's it's really all about making a great impression at a very crucial time in the onboarding. The second thing also is um, the earlier the agency gets access, the the, the quicker they can actually generate results, right? Yes. And many agencies work on a maybe monthly uh, contract basis, right? But even if it's three months, like two weeks of waiting for access make a huge difference. And so that's why our agencies love us because... It just gets them access much quicker. They can actually show that they're able to produce results, which then means they have better retention rates, uh, and and that allows, and then also probably better word of mouth. So a lot of things that that get together, which is why we've yeah we've now on like we've had we've given access to over one hundred forty thousand accounts at, at this point, right? We connect about uh, almost four thousand assets, so like accounts, but like also pixels and so on. Uh, over four thousand per week, so it's it's really a, a big scale at this point, and uh, it's it's great to be part of that. I I love I love that none of the things that you talked about have anything to do really with technology. It all has to do with trust, with showing up, with proving value, but it has nothing to do with the OAuth two implementation or whatever, right? Like it, it is really cool because that is the job to be done here is to build a relationship. And build a relationship that people can rely on 
and then use the use to build their own relationships, right? Like the agencies that you help, they want to build good relationships with their clients and their customers. So you build this relationship by building a great product for them and they build their relationship. That's really nice. It's kind of a relationship cascade that you're doing here. It's just very, a very interesting thing. Very cool. Um, that's, that, that is, yeah, wow. <laughs> I don't yeah, know what to thinking, say. This is thinking cool. about, yeah, thinking about jobs to be done also really helps to identify who are you actually competing with. So, um, you know, maybe there's not another software that does the same thing, uh, that, that your tool does or that, that we do. But obviously there are other, other ways to solve the problem. So for example, some agency owners may say, well, actually, I like spending time with the client and, and walked, walking them through which is hard at scale, but there might be some argument to say, well, this is actually not bad waste of time, maybe for some of them. Or others may have hired a, a VA to do that job. Or others um, may, you know, build a really fancy form that has loads of conditions depending on the, the setup that the client has to make that easier. So all of these are competitors to what we what we are doing and building, right? And and often I, we see, I see founders, this is more the mentoring side, that look at their product and are like, no, we don't have competition or like, well, it, it doesn't, it's impossible really, right? Because, because everyone would have found a way to solve the problem to some extent, maybe not perfectly, you know, without the solution that they, that, that the indie hacker is building, whoever's building basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think everything has competition, right? Like even, even like Disney plus or Netflix, their competition isn't necessarily the other big cloud streaming video providers. Their competition is you having something else to do. Like you, you having, you know, you wanting to do uh, go play sports or hang out with your family. That is competition for them as well. A attention competition. That's a very interesting point. Do you use, um, all these many different things, which I bet there are many of you just said forms. People probably email back and forth. They do these kind of virtual hangouts and walking people through. Do you use that in your own? like search engine marketing or your pay-per-click marketing like any any kind of paid that that you explicitly look for people who try to find other ways and then you kind of pull them into your own world great question yeah yes yes of course we try to right um it, we try to so obviously we have we do a lot of SEO. So obviously my background is SEO. This is also interesting. We actually didn't do so much SEO in the beginning because I was like, well, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be so much traffic uh -huh. around this. <laughs> but actually then <laughs> I wrote, wrote maybe one really good article and it's, it's, it started to, to rank at some point and get quite a lot of traffic. And we're like, oh, maybe we should do more. <laughs> so yeah, now we're doing a lot more SEO and highly recommend it to, to anyone out there. Even if you think, even if you think that there's not a lot of traffic around what you're solving, there, there will be and to some, like at least the people that you're trying to, to find, they will be searching for something. So we have a lot of topics around what agencies are, what problems they're facing when they're growing or automating, for example. So that's, that's an area. We have loads of guides on how to give or request access to all the platforms you can imagine. So that, that's probably straightforward. Um, and, Maybe we should have should have more around like how to hire a VA and then you know touch <laughs> into that. But yeah, yeah. So and also in our ads as well, right? So we try to make them feel this pain point, show them some kind of videos of of people getting being in despair, looking at their Facebook business manager. This was actually our first ad. It was me scrolling through Facebook business manager, like getting like some kind of like, getting angry and 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 sad about it at the same time and and it worked pretty well so yeah <laughs> it's, it's really cool to hear and and i'm just i'm just seeing like a a very interesting journey here from from you just finding something that you were really good at which is the whole ads space right building something for lead gen figuring out this is not enough talking to people, learning about their deepest need, which is not even just about onboarding. It's about relationship building and then building something that they really want to use because it gives them something to project towards their own customers. That That is an amazing journey. And what, what sticks out to me, what stands out to me is that it took every single step along the way to get to where you are today. I think that that is something that we often forget, right? As indie hackers, we, we always think we have the perfect solution. We have everything we need, but it takes all this experimentation and stuff along the way. It's very cool. What, what is next for Leedsy? Where are you going to go from here? Are you just going to grow and just uh, uh, take 34,000 a week into 40,000 a week? Or are you, are you going to expand? Where, where do you want to go with that? Uh, also a really good question. So, um, 
yesterday we did a, a hackathon. Uh, that's something that's, that's super interesting. The first time we did that. Uh, so about a slightly different way of using our tool for, um, for influencer whitelisting, for example. So if anyone who's listening is inter interested in influencer whitelisting and is using some tool or no tool or whatever, please reach out to me. Um, um, but so anyway, my point is we have a lot of ideas of uh, things that really excite us and we believe are going to add value to, to agencies and possibly also to, to brands or other companies in general. Or to, we also have some SaaS that are using us in some way. So it's not just agencies, but the core is agencies still. Um, there are a lot of other integrations that we want to, to integrate with or platforms we want to support. So that's always straightforward. But um, the cool thing is, even after basically four years since the very inception of Leedsy, which took some turns, but we're still super excited to, to work on it. And I think... Um, that's that's really fun and great, and there's going to be some cool things that are going to come for sure. Should watch watch the space. Yeah, I, I was going to say, what, where do I go to watch the space? Where do you want people who are not not just interested in Leetsy? I would love. I'm going to put the link to Leetsy in there because I think it's it's a really really interesting indie product to begin with that solves real problems for real people. I love this kind of stuff. But if, if people want to follow the journey of the business and your journey, where do you want them to go? Perfect. Yeah, I mean, so for Leetsy, check out leetsy.com. Um, and for myself, um, I am on, on Twitter. I'm nowhere nearly as, uh, successful <laughs> as someone else on this, in this conversation here. <laughs> uh, so now I, so yeah, check me out. Um, uh, Joe Radig. So J O R I R A D I G is my handle. Um, I'm sure Arvid's going to link that in the show notes and, um, you can, you can get in touch with me there or LinkedIn if you want. Um, but yeah, these are the these are the main places to find me. I highly recommend it. It's really cool. I'm really glad that we we got to have this conversation. I think I, I learned a lot from you today. I hope you had a couple opportunities to think about where where you come from and like how how again how important all these steps are. I think like looking back in, back in retrospect, uh, it's it's really cool to see what is needed to build a successful business. So thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom, all your insights, and those a lot of tiny little tips for indie hackers to improve many different aspects of their work. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the show. Big pleasure, Albert. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for today. I will now briefly thank my sponsor, Acquire.com. Imagine this. You're a founder who's built a really solid SaaS product. You acquired all those customers and everything is generating really consistent monthly recurring revenue. That's the dream of every SaaS founder, right? Problem is you're not growing for whatever reason. Maybe it's lack of skill or lack of focus or plain lack of interest. You don't know. You just feel stuck in your business with your business. What should you do? Well, the story that I would like to hear is that you buckled down, you reignited the fire, and you started working on the business, not just in the business. And all those things you did, like audience building and marketing and sales and outreach, they really helped you to go down this road, six months down the road, making all that money. You tripled your revenue and you have this hyper successful business. That is the dream. The reality, unfortunately, is not as simple as this. And the situation that you might find yourself in is looking different for every single founder who is facing this crossroad. This problem is common, but it looks different every time. But what doesn't look different every time is the story that here it just ends up being one of inaction and stagnation because the business becomes less and less valuable over time and then eventually completely worthless if you don't do anything. So if you find yourself here already at this point or you think your story is likely headed down a similar road, I would consider a third option and that is selling your business on acquire.com because you capitalizing on the value of your time today is a pretty smart move. It's certainly better than not doing anything and acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already. Just go check it out at try.acquire.com slash Arvid, it's me, and see for yourself if this is the right option for you, your business at this time. You might just want to wait a bit and see if it works out half a year from now or a year from now, just check it out. It's always good to be in the know. Thank you for listening to the Bootstrap Founder today. I really appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter at Avid Kahl, A R B A D K A H L. And you find my books and my Twitter course there too. If you want to support me and this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, get the podcast in your podcast player of choice, whatever that might be. Do let me know. It would be interesting to see. And leave a rating and a review by 
going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. It really makes a big difference if you show up there, because then this podcast shows up in other people's feeds. And that's, I think, where we all would like it to be, just helping other people learn and see and understand new things. Any of this will help the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day and bye-bye.